conduct the Pleiadian mission a time of awareness part 17. Pleiadian prophecy. The following section is prophecy based on information given to Billy by the Pleiadians and other highly advanced spiritual beings for the people purchased by writing to Billy in Switzerland. President Reagan. The Pleiadians said that President Reagan would be the man who through his deeds will accomplish everything in a way that will cause the old prophecies of the Bible to come to pass, and bring us closer to the next war. He will be too aggressive and bent on solving everything through military force and rearmament. Remember, these forecasts were made and documented in 1975. President Clinton may well be the last president elected in our normal manner. The Volcano Vesuvius in Italy the volcano Vesuvius will erupt. This event will be a signal that the Third World War is imminent and hard to avert. The eruption will be caused by all of the negative energy in Rome. Nowhere else on the planet is there as much negative and hostile energy as there is in the Vatican State. The Earth people should know that even though the papacy talks of peace, they have been the major cause of death and suffering on the planet for 2,000 years. Even though the volcano Vesuvius is closer to Naples, the main activity of the volcano is very deep under the city of Rome. The Antichrist already lives. Billy first reminded me that the prophecies of the Bible are like any other future vision and are not fixed events. Prophecy of the future can be changed and never actually happens exactly as it is predicted, so it is only a projection based on events that are happening at the time the prophecy is made. A prophecy is only a harbinger of things that could happen. It is meant to warn man, giving him the opportunity to do something to change the future so that the prophecy does not happen. This is why prophecies are usually always negative events, they are the ones that need to be changed in the case of the Antichrist, the problem is that man is doing nothing to control his future or change the events of the future, so the biblical prophecy till has a very high probability of happening. To begin with, the man who will be known as the Antichrist will be born to a devoted woman of God in an inconspicuous place around sunrise, during the seventh hour, and brought to the east where he is to nearly starve to death. He will be saved and taken in by an evil one who knows who he really is. He will come into his own personal power at the age of eleven, and surround himself with like-minded people for the next eight years. At first it will appear as if he is a follower of Jesus Christ, but he will soon place himself above God. His reign of terror will last for 27 years, at a loss of two-thirds of the life on our planet. During the 27 years of war, most of Europe will perish and many new diseases, caused by the decaying bodies, will flourish. We will see the end of the British Empire as we know it, and China will invade and take over India. As the Antichrist invades Italy, the Pope will go into hiding for years, and Christianity all but disappears. He will be the 266th Pope and will be the last one. The Antichrist will not be responsible for causing the war, but will be a spokesperson for an organization that is. All of the names he will be called and his organization will numerically be connected to the numbers of 666. Billy then closed his comments by telling me that the world organization that will be involved with the Antichrist has something to do with the initials WV this is not an acronym for the name of the organization but it has something to do with it. I have never figured out what these initials mean. By the way, Billy also commented that the Antichrist is alive now. So our future is racing towards us and will probably occur just as the prophecies predict if we do not do something about it. Natural Disasters Volcanoes such as we have never seen, from the very core of the planet, will erupt and fill our atmosphere with smoke and debris, making it very difficult to live in many parts of the planet. Deep in the Peruvian jungles, giant warriors, who were the old enemies of the Incas, will appear from their hiding place, a deep tunnel in the earth. They have been living underground for thousands of years, but will surface and raid villages for food and then hide back in their underground tunnels. In Peru there will be a severe earthquake in Udine from deep within the earth's core. America and its islands are areas named as suffering from the great smoke from the planet's core. There will be great fires in Japan, Arabia, China, and India. The prophecies state that much of the earthquake activity is caused by our atomic explosions and the robbing of the planet of oil and gases. There are many of us who are aware of how we are ruining our planet and must make an even greater effort to motivate others to do their part to save our planet before it's too late.
If we are to avert some of the planetary disasters, we must stop the underground testing and the robbing of our natural resources. Large tidal waves will sweep over the east coast of America and cause tremendous loss of life. The waves will continue across the Atlantic and roll over England, plunging deep into northern Europe before they stop. This is one of the main reasons Billy lives high up in the hills. The Great California Earthquake Not all of the events of the future were predictions or prophecy. On March 18, 1978, Billy was brought aboard a Pleiadian beanship by the base commander, Quetzal, for the purpose of fulfilling a request from Billy to see some events in the future. Quetzal had consented and arranged for a special beamship that was capable of moving in time. The normal beamships do not have this ability, so he had to obtain a suitable craft that was capable of taking Billy on this excursion. Once on board the beamship, Billy asked Quetzal to take him into the future to see the next great earthquake in California. He had never before seen an event like this while it was happening, and was very anxious to watch. After setting some instruments, Quetzal informed him that they would leave immediately for a future time in California. The beam ship that they were in would be able to make the shift in time and put them in a position so that Billy could see the event take place. Quetzal warned, though, that they would only be able to stay in the future for about 30 minutes. He gave no explanation for this, and Billy didn't press for one since his interest in science was minimal. The Pleiadian craft left the Earth and instantaneously was high above the planet, leaving Earth looking as small as a basketball. Then, just as quickly as it had left, the craft zipped back down to the surface. As they raced back into the atmosphere, the spacecraft had moved several years into the future to a time around the end of the 20th century. It is not possible to know the exact date, and it would not make any difference anyway, because it would be inaccurate. The earthquake had been traced to a specific time through the use of what is called an event clock, a technology that follows the path of events to a certain point in time. If they returned here every day, the date of the earthquake would be slightly different each time, for the future is not a fixed thing, but merely a projection of events based on the present and affected by the free will of man. As the beam ship moved down close to the ground, it was explained that they were in California somewhere over the San Andreas fault line and the earthquake would start in just a few minutes. They were about 180 miles south of San Francisco when the earthquake started. At first the ground started moving slightly, and then with a jolt, it seemed to split and break apart. There was a tremendous noise as the fault line looked like a snake writhing across the ground. The quake would be greater than any in current history and would take a great toll on California. To the south the city of San Diego would suffer from flooding, but it would survive. On the other hand, San Francisco would be hardest hit, sustaining greater damage. The beam ship moved to a point southeast of San Francisco where the quake was still shaking the ground. Most of the city was on fire and covered with a blanket of smoke. The Golden Gate Bridge was broken in half and was lying in the water. The Transamerica Building was the tallest building standing, and it was broken in half. Most of the city was in rubble, with a tremendous loss of life. Since the 30 minutes was almost used up, it was time me to leave. The great amount of destruction was devastating. Remember, nothing is ever as bad as it seems. The death of Sim Jace. At the center there is a hallway off of the kitchen that leads to a large bathroom slash shower for those working at the farm. On the wall is a colored drawing of Sim Jace walking away from her ship to meet Billy. It's not a real picture, but a beautiful lifelike representation created by artist Jim Nickel. I stopped to look at it every day, and let my mind ruminate a little on what it would have been like to have been there. To Billy it is a very important picture, for it reminds him of the lady from the Pleiades who had such an impact on his life. He had spent almost two years of his life meeting with her and working out the problems of getting the Pleiadian message out to the public. I had heard several rumors that she had died or was killed as her ship flew into a sun. Something has happened that caused the Pleiadians to end the contacts, and I was curious to know if Billy felt like talking about it. When I brought it up, he told me the whole, sad story of how one small, accidental event had changed the course of events of the Pleiadian mission. The Story of Simjace Billy said that his contacts with Simjace had started in January of 1975, and that they had continued almost weekly for about two years. 
Most of these meetings with the off-world visitor had been inside of her beamship hovering somewhere in the Swiss mountains. On their 94th contact, however, she had come to Billy's home for a meeting that would have significant impact on future events for both of them. It was December 15, 1977 on a cold, snowy night, and Billy was entertaining Simjace in the meditation room, located just about 30 meters from the main farmhouse. The family and resident FIGU members were all gathered around the kitchen table discussing how exciting it was that Simjace was so close by. Perhaps they might even be lucky enough to see her leaving, or better yet, maybe there would be a chance to meet her. After all, she had allowed most of them to see her ship on one occasion or another, so the idea of meeting her at last didn't seem too far-fetched. Hanging on the wall was their schedule for meditation, which listed the names of all the members. But no one would be using the meditation room tonight. Yukabas was sitting quietly, keeping his thoughts to himself. Billy had told all of them that Simjace was coming tonight and to stay clear of the meditation room so as to not make her uncomfortable. Her senses were quite good and she would probably be able to detect anyone nosing around the little building. Her beamship was hovering somewhere directly above the sender, shielded from view by the energy screens. Yukabas couldn't help wondering what she really looked like in person. Billy had, of course, described her to everyone. He had even taken a picture of her once, but as forced to promise Simjace that he would not show it to anyone. Yukabas was just thinking to himself, what's the big deal, what harm could it cause to just peek through the window and have a look? He wasn't thinking of barging in or anything, he just wanted to see the mysterious lady from the Pleiades. The meditation room was very comfortable, as you might imagine from its name. It was an important place on the farm because it was the center for all of the FIGU members to meet in. It had become a monument to the rising consciousness of this little group as they studied the lessons given to them by Simjace. Most all of them had participated in the building of the room and could imagine just where she would probably be sitting, right next to the little space heater which warmed the bone-chilling cold Swiss air. It was a real honor that tonight the meditation room was being visited by the very person who had inspired it. Her being there somehow gave them all a feeling of approval and acceptance. Inside of the meditation room Billy and Simjace were very comfortably seated. Billy was listening intently. Simjace had met him here on some matter of importance that couldn't wait. She was just about to tell Bill the purpose of her visit when suddenly she stopped, held very still, and looked around as if something was wrong. She thought she heard someone knock on the door, and she asked Billy if he heard anything. Billy cocked his ear and tried to listen for what she had heard, but could detect nothing. He remarked that she must be mistaken, but Simjay said she was sure someone was at the door, and she rose to leave. As she stood up and moved away from her chair, she accidentally caught her foot on the table leg and tripped over the small space heater sitting on the floor. Billy quickly turned around in time to see her fall and hit her head against the wall just as her hand had pressed the small apparatus around her waist that caused her to dematerialize and return to her ship. Billy was disturbed by this, and being left alone in the room, he moved to the door to see if someone was actually there. Simjace had seemed so sure of herself, but he had heard nothing. But there he was Yakabus was hiding just outside the door in hopes of catching a glimpse of the Star Lady. Lily was very upset with Yakabus because he had embarrassed himself and ruined the meeting. Yukaba said he was sorry, he only wanted to have a look, he didn't mean any harm. He had hoped no one would detect him, and he could just steal his look and be gone. But instead, Simjace was gone. It wasn't until two days later that Billy was visited by a worried-looking Quetzal, the base commander for the underground complex in Switzerland. His pale limewhite expression caused Billy to inquire about his health. But it wasn't his health that was on his mind. He asked Billy to explain what had happened on the evening of the 15th, when Simjace had been present in the meditation room. The manner of his speech and his attitude gave Billy a little start, something was wrong, he was sure of it. For two days the whole affair it had bothered him. He was concerned about Yukabas messing things up, and then there was the nagging feeling that something might be wrong with Simjace. He had seen her hit her head on the wall, but then she still dematerialized and returned to her ship. Billy did the best he could to recount the evening to Quetzal. 
He told him how Yukabas had hidden outside the door, hoping to see Simjace, and that she had become alarmed and left the room. As he was explaining how he had seen her hit her head against the wall, a sudden wave of anxiety came over him because now he knew why Quetzal had such a sick look on his face. Simjace must have been hurt much worse than he had thought. This would explain why he hadn't heard from her for two days after leaving so quickly. She had come to talk about something important, it only made sense that she would have contacted him soon afterward. Quetzal had been waiting for Simjace to return to the base two nights ago, for he knew she was having a meeting with Billy in the meditation room. He was the base commander and watched over Simjace like she was his own child. When she didn't come back or send a message, he had gone looking for her, only to discover her lying in her ship, which was still hovering undetected above the farm. She had a broken arm and a heavy fracture at the base of her skull. She was in a coma and close to death. Quetzal immediately transported her body into his ship and took off for their home planet of Era for medical attention. She had been lying in her ship for hours with serious brain damage, and was still seven hours away from help on her home planet in the Pleiades. Upon arriving on Era, Simjace was taken directly to their scientist who, unfortunately, could do nothing. There was too much damage to the brain, and she had been without medical help for many hours. They had done their best to take out the damaged brain tissue, but were powerless to do any more. Once her situation had been stabilized, Simjace was frozen. Her father Ta had made a desperate call to their friend, Askit, who was the representative for a highly evolved race of beings called Timers, who were from a neighboring universe the Pleiadians referred to as the Tao universe. Technically, they were far more advanced than the Pleiadians, and might have a way of saving her that was beyond the science of Era. It was soon discovered that Askit and her people could not do anything either, but encouraged everyone to not give up. They had an idea that might work to save Simjace's life. There was a race of people called Sonus, who had an understanding of life far beyond Askit's people. If they could somehow get in touch with them, perhaps they could come to her aid. Askit was successful and within a short time, several beings called Sonus suddenly appeared in the medical room on Era where Simjace's body lay. They had not traveled by ship, but just seemed to appear, as if they had projected themselves across the far reaches of a universe by the sheer power of their own minds. Their medical methods were unusual, to say the least, for they offered no explanations and set to work immediately, needing no help from the scientist of Era. After making sure the dead parts of Simjace's brain had been removed, they took the frozen brain acids from her body and inserted it into some kind of artificially produced plasma proton that they had brought with them. This was put inside of her skull, which was then closed up. Within minutes, Simjace returned to consciousness with no memory of the last 42 hours or of what had happened to her. She simply opened her eyes and brought a sigh of relief to everyone in the room, and the life force raced through her body and let everyone know that she was going to be all right. Simjace was back from the dead, and the men from Sona disappeared as quietly as they had come, returning to their home world somewhere far off in another universe. It was a week, a very long week for Billy, before he once again heard from Quetzal. He had been informed by the Pleiadians that Simjace was dead, but he somehow wasn't going to feel comfortable until he heard it from Quetzal. He waited patiently at the location that he had been led to by the telepathic impulses from Quetzal, and watched for the familiar silver disc that would soon dash out of the sky. Soon he noticed the birds begin to rustle in the trees and take flight, and within a few moments his old friend from the Pleiades had arrived, it was sort of like a family reunion. Quetzal quickly reassured Billy that Simjace was well. He apologized for taking a whole week to make it back to Earth but he was delayed from the many things that he had to do in consequence of Simjace's accident. One of these was the replacement for Simjace at the base in Switzerland. This would be a man named Asados, who would be here for about six or seven months helping out. He was unfamiliar with Earth and with the work that Simjace was doing with Billy, so it had been decided that Billy would not have any contacts with him and that he, Quetzal, and two ladies names Manara and Playa would continue on with the task of instructing Billy until such time as Sinjace might again be ready to take up her duties. This change would cause some problems for Billy, for he had been working with Sinjace on several problems concerning certain members of the group. 
This would now come to a halt because Quetzal had no knowledge of these things. Billy was even more let down to find out that when Simjace did return, she probably would not be able to resume all of her duties, for part of her recovery was to take it easy and not challenge her brain too much. She would need some time for the implanted plasma to heal the brain, and she was to rest and relax as much as possible. It had been decided that she should not engage in any work that would be too mentally challenging. Even though the Sonians were very advanced, the transformation of the artificial protoplasm would take three or four years before it would become a natural part of her brain. The brain is the central steering of the human, and because of this, the brain needs attendance and a special energy supply. This energy supply is the cosmic electrical energy of life that nourishes and feeds the brain material as well as the spirit. It should be made clear that this life force provides nourishment, but no impulses for healing or regeneration. Because of this, if the brain becomes sick or hurt, it is not capable of regenerating or healing itself. Sinjace's brain now contained the artificial plasma put there by the Sonians, which restored the use of her brain and allowed the life force to flow once again through her. Part of the programming of this artificial plasma was to heal the brain by transforming the plasma into real brain matter that will be accepted by the cosmic electrical life force, becoming part of her natural brain material within three to four years before the body rejects the foreign material. A rather amazing feat of engineering indeed. Until this tragic event, the Pleiadians had no knowledge of the existence of the Sonians, so little was known except these few details which they had learned in the past few days. The Sonians are from the Tao universe, which is adjacent to our universe. Their average lifespan is around 2,360 years. They grow to be about 68 inches tall and have skulls approximately 50% greater in size than our own. The name Sonus comes from some language which was completely unknown, and their spiritual development is 4,000 years in advance of the Pleiadians. Their knowledge of time and space was quite impressive, too, for they were able to project themselves through the universe without the need of flight machines, utilizing only the force of their minds. This really impressed Quetzal, for this was far beyond anything the Pleiadians were capable of. The recent demonstration of the Sonians' ability to control the flow of the cosmic life force and to heal Simjace's brain brought up the idea that they might be able to live forever, but even though this may be possible or several thousand years, at some point the material body can last no longer and gives up. The spirit will run out of energy and go to sleep, causing the individual to fall into the death cycle. It is a natural part of the creational logic, dictating that the spirit must have its sleep at some point in order to regain its energy and cogitate what it has experienced throughout the material life, adding those experiences to the accumulated wisdom that will be carried forward to the next life. It is unnatural for man to tamper with its process beyond a certain point. The prognosis for Simjace looked good. She was told to stay home for a few months and rest her mind and not engage in new mental challenges. Her brain would need time to heal, and it would not be good for her to endure any undue stress or anxiety for a while. Consequently, she would not be able to continue her contacts with Billy on Earth. This was very sad news for Billy for he had developed very close feelings for Sinjace over the years, and felt responsible for her accident because of Yukabas. He had been trying so hard to control all of the egos, jealousy, and petty arguments that were continually going on among the FIGU members, moreover, he also was a father, contactee, and prophet. But many of the members were very headstrong and difficult to deal with. The stress on Billy was becoming too much for him, and it showed in his health. He was losing too much sleep and letting himself get run down. Is it time to stop the contacts? The Pleiadian Council had been watching Billy very closely and could see that he was having a lot of leadership problems with the FIGU members that were affecting the mission. Now that Simjace would not be able to continue the contacts, they were very concerned that it could be time to stop them. They instructed Quetzal to have a meeting with Billy to explain the situation. It was very difficult for Quetzal to tell Billy that it may be time to stop the contacts. He had grown very fond of him and could tell by the look on Billy's face that he was hurt. He knew he would miss Billy, and there was the problem of the Pleiadian mission. The Pleiadians had hoped that they were educating Billy and making their presence known to the public through the photos he had taken that they could help change Earth's future to a more peaceful and happy outcome. 
The dark times that would come around the turn of this century could be avoided if mass consciousness could be affected in the right way, and they were putting their hopes in Billy. Now it seemed that most of their work may have been for nothing, for Billy had not made the contact notes easily accessible to the public. In addition, he had not followed through with his promise to give more public speeches as he had been asked, and several of the FIGU members had become such a problem that they were jeopardizing the mission. Things were not working out as well as they hoped, and with Simjays out of the picture, the prospects for the future did not look very good. As Quetzal continued to explain the Pleiadians' viewpoint, Billy agreed that certain members of the FIGU who were angry and jealous would have to go. Quetzal would help Billy by monitoring the thoughts of these individuals in order to help him better understand them. Billy agreed to cut back on his work and take care of his health and delegate more responsibility to others. The contacts would continue for a while with Quetzal until Tiny found out if Sinjace could return. For the next couple of months things seemed to be going well. Quetzal had made suggestions to Billy to ask certain people to leave the FIGU and to change his own work habits. The Pleiadian Council went along with Quetzal and left the decision up to him for a while, but they made it clear that if the FIGU could not get their egos in line, the contacts must stop. For Billy and Quetzal things were developing nicely. The relationship between the two had developed into a good friendship, and Quetzal had taken time for several contacts which were very beneficial to Billy. His easy-going manner and rather obvious intellect were proving to be a great stimulator for Billy. But not everything was going well. The council back on ERA had been monitoring the thoughts of the FIGU members and found that instead of getting better, the attitudes were deteriorating and becoming even more harmful to the Pleiadian mission. Billy seemed to be lacking in leadership abilities, and some of the people in the FIGU had become so emotionally unbalanced that they served no purpose to the mission, and were becoming destructive to themselves. It was on Monday, April 10, 1978, when Quetzal informed Billy that the group was failing and future contacts would be limited to telepathic transmissions to Billy only. The FIGU was on probation. If they could not get their thinking straightened out, the group would have to be dissolved and could no longer take part in the mission. Reunited with Simjays. It was only a few weeks later on May 20, 1978 that Billy felt the familiar presence of Simjays in his thoughts. She and Playa, her sister, were coming to see Billy. She was feeling better and wanted to see her old friend whom she missed so much. Billy quickly dropped what he was doing and raced out of the house to meet her. She led him to a remote spot not far away and picked him up into the ship. Billy was flushed with excitement as he saw her again. He had really missed her. But here she was, just as before, with that pretty face and long, red hair and that gentle manner that always made Billy feel so comfortable and loved. She was back and seemed healthy. He was hoping she would never leave. Simjace gave Billy a hug that seemed to last forever. It had been five months since they had seen each other, and they were making up for it all at once. Billy suddenly noticed Playa was there and broke up the hug to say hello. He had not seen her for over a year, when he taught her how to ride his moped one afternoon in the forest. Everyone was happy and smiling and remarking how nice it was to see each other again. It was a great reunion for all of them. Simjays had been recuperating for months and seemed healthy enough. The Sonians and their technology had seemed to work wonders. Her brain was slowly repairing itself and while she had trouble remembering some things, she seemed pretty much herself. Life at home had been very calming for her and had given her plenty of time to relax and catch up on her home life. She had spoken with the Pleiadian Council about Billy and the group before coming here, for they were concerned about her ability to return to work. Unfortunately, she had to inform them that she would not be able to continue with the contacts or her other work, the doctors had informed her that her brain was healing slower than anticipated, and she should continue to take it easy. Billy was sad to hear this because he was hoping that she would be able to resume their contacts. Although he was really finding a helpful friend in Quetzal, he certainly missed her. Once the council was told that Simjace would not be able to continue, they had consulted with Quetzal about the progress of the FIGU members, and were told that things were getting worse. Several of them were openly trying to cause Billy trouble. 
they were making up untrue stories about Billy to hurt his feelings and causing other problems that rendered the group dysfunctional. None of the FIGU members were taking the spiritual teachings seriously and were questioning Billy's authority so much that he had no control anymore. It had been decided that the group was on probation for seven months. They would have to take their commitment of personal development more seriously and work to help Billy, or they would no longer be allowed to help him with the mission. Quetzal would continue having contacts with Billy, but the contact notes he would write would no longer be available to the members. Billy had to agree, things were beyond him. He was very worried and out the state of affairs. He had tried his best to help everyone get along, but there were some pretty headstrong people in the FIGU, and the seriousness of the pressure that was on them to help with the contacts and to be responsible for getting the Pleiadian information out to the world was proving to be too much for some of them. They had developed elitist attitudes, believing that they were better than other people, and fought among themselves like cats and dogs. The rivalry over self-importance was bringing the whole group down, and the Pleiadians would have no more of it. The mission to help the people of Earth through the understanding of higher consciousness could not be accomplished by this kind of thinking. Breakdown The following weeks were very difficult for Billy. He couldn't sleep or get any work done. There was so much pressure on him from everyone around him that he was unable to think straight. He was beginning to feel like he had failed the planet Earth. In his mind he was responsible for the future of Earth, and he was letting everyone down. He had tried so hard to perform his mission as well as he could, but things were out of control. He did not possess the leadership qualities to control the FIGU, and the pressure he felt to keep the contacts going was too much for him. It was on Monday, July 17, 1978, while on his way to meet Quetzal for a contact, that Billy's health failed him. He was in the forest waiting for Quetzal to meet him when suddenly he collapsed and fell to the ground. His health had given out, and he was having a nervous breakdown. He blanked out, losing consciousness, and lay flat on his back in a small gully near the contact site. It was just a few minutes before the alert mind of Quetzal picked up on Billy's condition and raced to his aid. He was not surprised that Billy had collapsed. He had been warning him for weeks to protect his health. Now it was too late, Quetzal sensed that Billy was suffering a breakdown of his nervous system and quickly brought him up into the ship. Billy was still unconscious as Quetzal quickly examined his body and internal organs. He was right. Billy was having a nervous breakdown caused by exhaustion and anxiety. Fortunately, Pleiadian science is far beyond our current understanding, and Quetzal immediately knew what to do. As Billy slowly regained consciousness, he looked up at Quetzal, who quickly told him not to speak yet, just relax and he would be okay in a moment. He was passing some small device over Billy's body which was reviving the nervous system and restoring his health. Within minutes Billy seemed much better and was able to sit up and talk. He almost felt normal. The device had somehow repaired the nervous system and balanced the cells of the body, relieving the stress, and pumped energy into his body. Billy felt pretty good actually, and wasn't even aware of what had happened until it was explained to him. Quetzal informed him that he had suffered a nervous breakdown brought on by the problems at the center. It would take 12 to 14 days for the nerves to completely regenerate themselves, but he would be okay. Quetzal moved his ship close to the center and materialized Billy's body into his own bed so he could relax and get some rest. The highly developed consciousness of Quetzal caused Billy to fall into a deep sleep without worry and anxiety so his old friend could heal himself. Quetzal was very concerned because his was a strong indication that Billy could no longer control himself or the FIGU, this is the end of part 17. For more information about the Pleiadian mission, please visit, thepleiadianmission.com. Again please visit, thepleiadianmission.com. Also subscribe and share this video. Let the whole world know the truth. Thank you for listening. Remember that knowledge is power. Please, don't be left in the dark. Please continue to part 18 in the next video.